Welcome to New Branch Community Church. We're so glad you're here today, and we do take just a second to welcome you guys and acknowledge you guys joining us online and by phone. We are in a series called Famous Last Words, and we're taking a look at the words of Jesus Christ on the cross, which are some of the most profound words ever spoken. Um, but they're not just profound, they're also very practical to our lives. And so today we're going to take a look at one of the statements he made. But before we do that, here's some famous last words that I've thought of that go, these are probably some of the ones that, that probably would be said before I would die. So, so anyway, we'll, we'll look at these. Um, here's the first one. Um, are you sure the power's off? That, that's kind of one that I've thought of to say, you know, <laughs> you know, Marie, did you cut the power off? And we end up like this. And that's actually happened. So anyway, all right, so, and here's the second one. Um, a lot of us go hiking, and so I wonder where the mama bear is. And I've seen some people, they think they're so cute little bears. And uh, I don't know, has anybody ever went between a mama and its cub? No, because if you did that, you wouldn't be here, right? I mean, that's what happens. So, okay, so that's famous last words. All right, so here's another one um, for you guys in the military. You know, I pull the pin, um, and uh, I count to what? Anybody? <laughs> and uh, you don't want that kind of guy around you, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and, then, and then for my redneck, Folks that are here, you can see if maybe this looks like one of your family reunions. Uh, these are some last words. Hold, hold my beer and watch this. Anybody said that one? <laughs> <laughs> and that was taken from one of our church members' family reunion. I'm just playing. It <laughs> Anybody relate to that one? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Okay. So, but all joking aside, one of the ones that's probably the saddest words that you could ever speak, which could be your last words, um, because it will define your life, is this. I will never forgive you for that. Um, anybody ever said that? Anybody ever thought that? Anybody there today and you go, don't mess with that because you don't know what you're getting into. And today we're, we're going to kind of mess with that a little bit because these could be last words and you don't want them to be. Um, we're going to take a look at what Jesus had to say about that from the cross. Um, it's amazing that Jesus, Jesus being an amazing communicator that he was, the fact of the matter is he communicated more from the cross than we could ever imagine. And um, not only with words, but with other things. But he also had the time and the... <laughs> the amazing ability to communicate as he's being crucified, which I just find to be unbelievable. So today we're going to take a look at those words. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles or in your Bible apps, um, you can follow along with me. On your, in your outline, we only have one of the verses, but you can go back and look this up. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. In fact, we'll put it up on the screen. It says this, When they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Um, and last Sunday, we, we, um, we started to unpack what it meant for him to be crucified, and so I won't get into all the details of it today. Um, we are going to be watching The Passion of the Christ on Good Friday at 7 o'clock, so if you want to know what it looks like, um, Mel Gibson did an amazing job depicting the crucifixion, but unless you were there, you don't know what it's like. Unless you're the one being crucified, you definitely don't know what it's like, and the experience is unbelievable. Um, they said they beat him where he didn't even look like a man. The Romans were extraordinarily brutal. And they did it with a purpose to go, if you're a criminal, you never want to commit a crime against Rome because this is what will happen to you. And they put you on display. So they got the most brutal people you can think of to do this. They had no qualms with that. And the fact of the matter that he's crucified with one on his right and one on his left um, just means this is another day in their life. You get it? He's just one in a number of people they're crucifying. It didn't mean anything to them. And it didn't. Um, he was crucified, his, his crime was blasphemy against God, meaning that he claimed to be God, um, and that was against Jewish law. Um, he did not commit a crime, he was God, so he didn't commit a crime, but even then, they probably wouldn't have crucified you for that, but, 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 the, but the religious rulers of that day really set him up. So he had been insulted that day, they said they beat him so bad he didn't look like a man, and now he's being crucified, and his first words on the cross, I want you to pay attention to, these were the first words that he uttered on the cross. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So his first words on the cross, he, he said, Father, forgive them. Um, really amazing that he had the wherewithal to say that. Uh, most of us might not be thinking that when it comes to this occasion. The other thing I want to point out was after all that had happened and all that was happening, meaning, meaning he says that to them, for they know not what they do, and they keep going as if nothing's happening. In fact, they're so bored, they're casting lots, which means they're playing dice or they're gambling for his clothes. That's how insignificant what he's saying is to them, if, if that makes any sense to you. Um, 
Jesus' words on the cross were more than just words that were randomly selected. They, they were prophetic. Um, hundreds of years before Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah 53, 12, you can write it down if you want to go back and look it up. He says about Christ, he says, For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for their transgressors. Um, I don't know that Isaiah even understood the depth of what he was writing, um, as many of the prophets didn't. I don't think anyone would have realized that Christ would have been making intercession for us on the cross itself. Um, but yet he was. That was more of a prayer. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Now, I want to pause there because I think there's some practical application to our lives in, in, this, in this statement. Because I've got to tell you, while it sounds so spiritual and I appreciate what Jesus did, that's not how I feel when somebody does wrong to me. Is it you? My first response typically isn't, Father, forgive them. If I was Jesus on the cross, you know, I'm dying for the sins of the world, but as soon as you insulted me, get it? <laughs> you know, the beating and all that stuff, you get it. But, but the insults and you talking down and the people coming around and talking bad and you're still casting lights and now I'm looking down at you going, do I really want to die for that? I'd be more like, Father, you know, kill them, right? We wouldn't think that. Father, I want to see the days of Elijah call down fire from heaven, incinerate everybody on this hill, and I'll be justified, and that's how I feel. If we're real honest, is that how we feel sometimes? And if we're real honest, that's how we, a lot of us would struggle with forgiveness, right? As they're crucifying you, you didn't do anything wrong. I don't, I don't feel like forgiving. And, and, and I want you to think about it from your perspective, because you might be saying, well, that sounds almost sacrilegious until we start looking at our own lives, and you go, do you struggle with forgiving? When someone insults you, or maybe they have, are you struggling with forgiving people in your life? Um, are you struggling letting some of that go? Or you try to let it go, maybe, maybe that's where you're at today, as I've been for years, to say, oh, no, no, I've let that go. I got on my face before God, and I've let that go. Or, or I tried, and I've let that go. I forgot all about that. It doesn't bother me anymore, yet it's defining you. And you kind of know it. You go, that thing behind it, and there's anger outbursts, and there's all these things that happen, and you're going, I don't know where that comes from. And today we want to kind of look at it because Jesus Christ was making intercession for us. And he taught his father, forgive them. It, before Christ, our response and probably the response of most of the world would be this. If you do me wrong, here's what it is. You owe me. You can write it down if you want to. Um, you owe me. Justice is mine. Anybody feel that way? Because I'm right. I mean, if I'm right and you're wrong, I have every right to hold you to this. And that's true. In fact, doesn't even the Bible teach that? We'll, we'll take a look at the scripture in fact, Jesus taught it himself. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, he said this, You have heard that it was said. Why did they hear that it was said? Let me tell you why they heard it was said. Because it's Old Testament. This is the law. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Meaning, if you gouge out my eye, I'll gouge out yours, right? If you hit me, I'll hit you. Anybody taught that when they were a kid? I'm not going to start it, but I will definitely finish it. Anybody feel that way? I'll get you back, you know? If, you know, I'm... That's just the way it's got to be. You know, I'll, I'll make you pay. I'm not going to let you. I'm not a doormat. I'm not going to get walked over. I'm not going to let this stuff happen to me. I was innocent, and you did that to me, and I won't forget, and I'm not, you know, I'll never forgive you for that. You get the idea? A tooth for a tooth. That's the way it's got to be. That's justice. And in one way, that's correct. But there's something that we have to explore today that is so huge in our Christian life that we, we focus a lot on one side of this issue but not as much on the other side. And today I want to kind of unpack it a little bit, and hopefully in the days to come we can unpack it more, and that is this issue of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is a, is a two-headed coin. Um, we, we would like to talk a lot in the church about forgiveness as it relates to us receiving forgiveness. And I believe that with all my heart. And if you're here today and you go, I have so much guilt, you can be forgiven, and God wants to forgive you. But can I tell you what's equal to that? is the other side of the coin that we have to forgive. That, that forgiveness is something that you receive, but it's also something that you have to give. Um, and, and you might want to think about that for a while because the two go hand in hand. In fact, I don't know that you can really have the forgiveness that God offers and withhold forgiving other people. Um, I, I'm not the only one that taught that. In fact, the after Christ response is this. Once you know Christ, once you follow Christ, the after Christ response is this, God forgave me, so I'll forgive you. 
I can put it a little more bold. God forgave me, and I have to forgive you. I cannot hold on to it and follow him at the same time. Jesus taught it when he taught us to pray. Jesus raised forgiveness to a whole new level, saying, I will forgive you, but you must forgive others. And if you don't, you're not following. Um, I I didn't make this up. I I wish I could read it differently. I've tried to read it differently. (laughs) I spent a decade of my life reading it differently, trust me. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, when he taught him to pray, he ends it with this, and he says, And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. That you can't be right with me and hold on to unforgiveness. Forgive is is a financial term. It means to pardon. It means to forgive a debt. It means to cancel out a debt. Jesus taught this in another place, and we're going to take a look at a parable that he taught. He oftentimes used stories to illustrate, because it's what, and he's such a master communicator because here's what he understood about storytelling. It's so much easier to talk about someone else than it is yourself, right? So if you were to tell somebody something hard truth about their self, they're not going to listen to it. But if they can see it through a story, it makes it a lot easier to, to brace for the impact. So, so here we go. Matthew chapter 18. You can turn with me your Bibles or write it down and go back and look this up. Maybe spend some time there during... Um, before Easter, to go, hey, what does this really mean? Matthew chapter 18, Jesus teaches a parable, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Jesus did this a lot of times. He would say, you want to know what what heaven is like? You want to know what the kingdom of God is like? Now, let me tell you what it's like. It's like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. Verse 24, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, if that's not hyperbole, you maybe you don't know what 10,000 bags of gold is, but that's today's time when, when, when your translation might say millions of dollars, and today it would be billions of dollars. It means he's got so much debt that he can't pay back. I mean, there's too much debt. That he can't even pay the interest on the debt. He, he's done. You know what I mean? He's bankrupt. There's nothing else that he can do. So what is the master going to do? Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So, aren't you glad we don't have those uh, financial laws today, right? <laughs> You're sold. Although, some of us can feel like that, right? I mean, I, I'm sold out to MasterCard or Visa or whatever else. And uh, we learned that during Ray, Dave Ramsey to go, man, we are a, a, a slave to the lender. And uh, they named those cards right, right? MasterCard and uh, American Distress and stuff. Okay, so, so, so he's going to sell them off. Verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. Now, <laughs> two things. The guy was desperate, right? So he's basically saying anything. He's going, look, don't sell me off. I'll pay it back. Now, just so you know, that's not true, okay? This guy owed so much, he would never be able to pay this back. He's promising things that he can't do, and the master knows that. But, verse 27 says this, the servant's master took pity on him, and canceled the debt, and let him go. Um, so that doesn't mean he's going to pay it back. It means that he canceled it. Um, so, so let me give you a couple lessons from this servant that, that couldn't pay. <laughs> let, let me give you some lessons from this forgiven servant. That's what it means. He canceled the debt. He forgave the debt. Uh, but before we go there, though, I want to say the king in this parable, because Jesus used parables to represent other things. So the king in this story represents God, and the servant in this story represents us. And here's what it says. It says the the lesson from from the servant is this, that the debtor can't always repay you, okay? Sometimes the debtor, like in this guy's case, he owed so much that he could never repay what was owed. There's things you can do in life that that you can't pay back. Does Does that make sense? Some things in life can't be undone. Is that right? And we studied a little bit of that in the book of James. Sometimes you can say things and you can't take them back. Now, you can be sorry for them, but you literally can't take them back. So we're not just talking about money, um, although money is part of it, right? Sometimes we can charge up so much money and owe people so much money, we'll never be able to pay it back. Sometimes we can say things and we can never take that back because although the person says, hey, you know, you know, you can try to make up for it, you can never take back that you said that, right? I mean, like, the, the guy that said to me, you know, you know, Mer- John and his, and his daughter came to visit me, and it's my wife. I mean, you can never take back that hurtful statement. As long as I live, I'll be hurt by that. I'm just playing. 
<laughs> Especially by my wife that continues to remind me over and over and over again. You remember when that happened? Remember how you... Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Get a few gray hairs and that's what happens. Whatever. Um, <laughs> some things you can do. You can't take them back, right? Some things, some things you can do to a person and you're going... You can't take back that you did that. Some hurts you do to somebody, and you go, that, you know, it, you can't just forget about that. It's just not easy to get, get past it. Um, some things can't be undone. Sometimes the debtor can't repay you. That's just the way it is. Number two, we learn this. The offender can always show mercy. The offender can always show mercy. Now, there's a lot of people that would go, you know what, I feel like this, and I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice how I feel. No, you don't have a choice how you feel, necessarily. You do have a choice what you do, right? And if you're the offended, you can always show mercy. It said that in verse 27 that I read, the servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt and let him go. Um, just a side note on this one. For some of us, the hardest thing in the world about forgiving somebody is this, is that what if the offender's not sorry? What if the offender doesn't even know they offended you? <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, like when the coach benches your kid and you go, man, I've been coming to these practices, I've been doing all this stuff, and now we come to the game and my kid don't get to play. What's up with that? You know, it's just all politics in this thing, and they don't even care, and they don't even know, right? And you go to them, and I, I've had this happen to me a lot of times where somebody comes and says, when you said that, you don't know what that did to me. I have been holding on to that for 20 years. And I'm like, what is your name again? I'm just, you know, <laughs> you hate to say that, right? And that's even worse. You know, it's like, I don't remember that ever happening. I'm so sorry. I don't know what state of mind I was in. Who knows what that was about? But they held on to that. Or maybe they misunderstood something for years, right? Do you know? And it makes it even worse, right? Or, or maybe this one. You did something great for somebody, and then they weren't grateful. Anybody have teenagers? I forgot my son was in first service, and so I was like, he's like, Dad. I'm like, oh, man, he's right here. And, uh, but isn't that true? Your teenager, they don't, they're not always grateful for what you did, and you do all this stuff, and, 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 and you can already hear it coming out of you, right? After all I've done, you ever felt like that? And you want to start telling them all the stuff you do, and it doesn't do any good, right? You know what's worse than that? You, let's say you're sitting in a big meeting, and they're getting ready to thank the person. They're getting ready to thank, and you, and you know it's you because you're like, I've done all this work. I've pulled this whole thing off, and everybody's here, and now they're getting ready to thank somebody, and they get up and they say, we'd like to thank, but it's not you, right? And it's somebody else that did less than you, and you're like, hmm, you know what's worse than not being thanked? Someone else getting thanked instead of you, <laughs> right? Anybody holding on? I know. I can see you guys looking all religious today like, no, we don't feel that way. <laughs> And I know you do. You know how I know? Because I've heard you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> didn't get a Christmas card. That was how I wrote that one down. Right? And some of, I, some of you might feel that way about our family. It, it, I just wanted to let the edge off. We ain't sent a Christmas card out to anyone for years. <laughs> we just don't send Christmas cards. <laughs> so if you sent one to us, and if that makes you mad, take me off your list. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Or people forget your birthday, had that happen? I have, you know, it's like, nobody remembered it this year. <laughs> what is up with that, right? Is it just, there's so many of them now that people forget, or what's the deal, you know? Or, or everybody got invited to some big thing, and you didn't get invited? It hurts sometimes, don't it? You don't want to say it, but, but you know what we do, right? My mom taught me this. My mom's here, so I can pick on her a little bit. Yeah, you go on my list, right? I'm not going to get mad. No, 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 no. But it's coming for you, okay? <laughs> it's coming, and you're on the list, and don't worry. It'll come back around to you. We'll get you. <laughs> We're not going to get mad. We're going to get even. We got you. Uh, let me tell you what Jesus taught, though. All joking aside. Luke 23, verse 34. It's on, it's on your outlines. He said this. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Um, and by the way, they don't care. <laughs> right after he uttered the words, they played dice for his clothes. He's naked on the cross. He's dying for the sins of the world. And they could care less about the Savior of the world. Father, forgive them. I used to read it like they don't know what they're doing as if they're ignorant. They are ignorant. But can I tell you what else? They're ambivalent. They, don't, they could care less about your hurts and your pains. They don't know about your hurts and your pains. Some of them aren't even here anymore. And they're reaching out from beyond the grave, all this stuff we were joking about. But some of these things aren't trivial, are they? 
And they're reaching out beyond the grave and they're holding on to us and we're going, I'll never be free from that kind of hatred. And Jesus is saying, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. I could add to that. They don't even care what they're doing. They don't even know that they did it. They don't even realize what they're doing. They don't even realize who I am and what this is and the greatest moment in all of history. And they're just, just like another day. Jesus taught us that. Um, we've been covering the story, and we're learning some lessons from this forgiven servant. The, the first part of what I'm covering here w- was profound, but I've got to tell you, the bigger part, not, that's not even half of the story, and so I've got a short video clip to explain the rest of the story of this servant. just been forgiven this tremendous debt. We're talking millions of dollars. He's just, I'm free, man, I got no debt. Could you imagine not having a mortgage payment, not having a car payment, everything paid off free and clear. The guy is like, I am a free man, no debt, no worries. And he comes out and he comes across a servant. And this servant owed him a thousand dollars and he grabs him by the neck and starts choking him, demanding payment. I mean, what is up with that? And the guy couldn't pay, so he had him thrown into prison. So then the king hears about this, who had forgiven him that huge, tremendous debt. And he calls him before him and says, you evil servant. I forgave you of this tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant, just like I had mercy on you? And then the angry king, he throws him into prison to be tortured until he can pay the entire debt. And this is what your heavenly father will do for you. If you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart, Why would God be so harsh? Why would he say such a thing? I believe it's because God knows that unforgiveness puts you in a prison. Unforgiveness is like sipping poison, expecting the other person to die. Unforgiveness puts you in a prison. So let me ask you, are you you in a prison today? Have you been drinking the poison? Are, are you, do, you have, do you have someone that you haven't forgiven? Anybody? I mean, if you were really to go deep down inside and you go, I, I don't even know that it's there. Maybe, maybe you're thinking like most people that, that forgiveness benefits that person that I'm going to forgive. And, and what we've missed out on the, on the whole issue of forgiveness is, is that you don't understand what forgiveness can do for you. When you hold on to it, you might think you're making them pay, but you're making yourself pay even more. Most miserable time in my entire life. And by the way, I'm only a fraction of a second from being right back there. Is holding on to unforgiveness. To, to hold on to that grudge, to hold on to that thing. that you got, I'll never let go of that. You can't ask me to let go of that. You might forgive them, God, but I'll never forgive that. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it'll crush you. It'll crush your soul. And the benefit and the release that I have discovered in releasing that hatred to God is more than anything I can ever tell you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how it is for everybody else. It was more than the release of guilt the day you learn to release because you feel so justified, right? Because it's just, they're wrong, and I can't let that go. They owe me, and they owe me a debt just like this guy. They owe a debt that they cannot repay. What do I do with that? Um, what about the big things? You know what I mean? What about, what about the huge things? What do we do with the gigantic, expen- the gigantic offenses in life? 
And, and I want to pause here because some of you may or may not have experienced that yet. But you, you, you may before life is over. Some of you have, though. And you're going, that sounds nice, John, because earlier you were talking about trivial things when somebody talks about you looking old or, or you know, just funny things that, that, that are petty that don't define us. But what about the huge things that define a life that no one can talk about? What do we do with that? How do we get beyond that? What do we do when someone has abused you? You know what I mean? Someone has hurt you so deeply. Someone has said something that has defined your life because they said it over and over and over, and I'll never be free from that, and you've tried. You know what I'm talking about? Or it's, they chose alcohol over me. They chose drugs over me. And they say they're sorry, but i got to tell you, it doesn't fix what happened to me. It doesn't fix the abuse that happened when they were under the influence and they beat my mother, or maybe you were the mother that was abused, or you... Or, you get the picture. And you're going, you just want me to let that go. You just want me to forget that. You just want me to, what do I, what do, I do? What do I do with offenses like that? What do I do with the ones, you mentioned a few here, John. You have no idea the offense that I have today. You talk about your petty little things you have, John, but you have no earthly clue what's going on inside of me. You don't know. And I don't, but God does. And what I want to tell you today, in the most loving way that I possibly can, is this. Is that Jesus' love is greater than any offense that you have. That Jesus Christ's love is greater than any offense that you have. He can release you from that. He can release you from that prison that you're holding so tight on. That He can hold you from having to drink that poison every day of your life. You can have a different life with joy instead of hatred. Let me give you a couple verses. The end of that servant's lesson was this. The master told him what? Ma Matthew chapter 18, verse 33. He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? So, so if you're struggling with that big offense, God is saying, the reason you can forgive is because I have forgiven you. In fact, he goes further to say it this way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. This is a different passage where Jesus is teaching on the area of forgiveness. And he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I got to tell you, for me, that was one of the hardest principles in all of the Bible. I hated that. <laughs> because for years I go, I've been taught all of my life, I've been taught from the scriptures and the plain reading of the text simply says this, is that salvation is by God's grace alone. So how on earth do you say it's hinged on me forgiving another person? Does that mean I have to do something to gain it? No. It means after you've received the forgiveness that only God can give, there's no possible way you could withhold forgiveness from another person. When you have experienced Christ, you cannot withhold forgiveness. It's not possible. It's not possible to withhold forgiveness when you know him. The hardest words in, in the whole world was this, forgiveness is a choice. Because many of us feel like because it happened, I don't have a choice in this. Because somebody's hurt you so bad, I don't have a choice. I didn't have a choice in what happened, and now I don't have a choice. I can never let that go, but you can through him. Through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I say, what I'm saying is not simple, and I know that. Um, I hope you're not taking it like I'm thinking this is a simple thing. I, I, and I think some people are going to struggle with what I say next, but... But you won't if, if you're the one struggling, because you'll get it. I believe with all my heart that God can help you forgive. I believe that it's a process. <laughs> I don't believe for everybody it's going to be just today. You're going to come down here, and it's all going to be gone, and you're never going to struggle with that again. I, maybe you've been taught that. 
And maybe that's the reason why when I talk about this, you think I'm teaching easy believism as if just give that up and now it doesn't define your life anymore. There's no more scars. There's no more pain. There's no more feelings. And you go, I've tried all that. I've tried to forget that it ever happened. Anybody ever felt that way? The, the other thing before I get too far, because I, I don't want to forget this part. If you're in an abusive relationship, I'm not saying go back into it. Okay, please don't think this wrong. Please don't think that God means forgive their debt and then go back and keep living in that abuse. It's never, there's never an excuse for abuse. There's never an excuse for allowing people to abuse you. But when you're in a safe place, and some of us are, and we still don't feel safe, they're dead and gone, but yet they're reaching out from beyond the grave and controlling your life. They have more control over you today than any other person. You don't understand what change you have on you when you don't forgive. And God doesn't want you to live that way. You see, maybe you're thinking, I'm saying, well, then just forget that stuff. And you know, that's the problem with the church. You know, you know, we, we, we've been teaching one principle so incorrect, and it's so hurtful that some people won't walk through the doors, and that's just forget that happened. Just act like it didn't exist. The, the amount of sexual abuse that we say, just let it go. You're supposed to forgive and act like it never happened. That's not true, by the way. And it, by the way, it doesn't work, does it? <laughs> Some of us know. It doesn't work. You can't forget. And it, Well, didn't God say he forgets as far as the east is from the west? Yes, he did. As if it never occurred? Yes, he does. But can I tell you what he's doing? It's not that God has amnesia. Okay? Jesus don't look at the cross, the marks on his hand. I've thought about this a long time. He's never looked at the marks on his hand and go, I don't know how I got this. He didn't erase his memory. That's not what forgetting means. It means he redefined what it means. He got to redefine his life. He got to reposition who he was. He got to give you a new life in Christ. And can I tell you that we love, we understand what it means when we talk about guilt and we receive a new life in Jesus Christ, right? It's true, and we do. But can I tell you what's equal, the other side of the coin? The day you're able to forgive is the same occurrence, if not even more, the day you can forgive. Because when you don't forgive, let me tell you what happens. You're a prisoner. So I'm not asking you to forget today. You know what I'm asking you to do? Remember. How can you forgive what you forgot, right? I mean, it's impossible. Don't just forget about it. Forgive it. And for some of us, we've been putting on a mask too long. Some of us, the most religious people in the room, the most ones, I've let that go years ago. That doesn't bother me anymore yet. You're seeing that outburst of anger come out of you over and over and over, and you're going, where does that come from? Why do I do this? How is this happening? Can I tell you? You never forgave. And when I hit that button, I can tell you what it's going to do when you actually get there. It's going to bring out a rage in you. <laughs> It's going to hit bitterness in you that you can't believe, and you're going to hate me for saying that today. That can't be right. And if that's the way God is, and I've said it too, if that's who God is, I want nothing to do with him. Get it? Yet, you know what changed my life? And I hope it's the same thing that will change yours. Is a Christ hanging on a cross that says, Father, forgive them. <laughs> You see, and I would think, you say you won't forgive me because I didn't forgive them, and I never did anything like them. <laughs> That's what I thought. That's my logic. Until he said, no, you don't understand. I paid for that too. I paid for all of your hurt. All of your hurt I bore on me. You remember what I talked last week? The darkness rolls in, and the wrath of God, of all the pain, of all the sin that's ever been rolled on him. And he goes, now, you know what? I can tell you, you can forgive. You want to know how? Because I paid for that. Is this enough for you to forgive? <laughs> and you can't have me. This is the toughest part in the world. This is going to be the hardest thing you ever do. Can I tell you what it is? To make a choice between your hate and Jesus Christ. Because you can't have both. <laughs> can I tell you something? Your hate's going to make you miserable. I don't pretend to know what you've been through. All I can tell you is this, is your hate will make you the most miserable person on the planet. But Jesus, he will fill you with love that you cannot even imagine. And I know because I've experienced it. And, and here's what I want you to know. It doesn't end today. This process of forgiveness doesn't end today for the big things. Okay? 
Okay, if you think it does, some of us are deluding ourselves. I went down in a conference, I gave it up, and I come back by Sunday night, right? I went away to a conference, and I gave all that up, and I came back, and it all came back on me. Anybody had that? And you're going, what is that about? Is he not big enough? Is Jesus not take that away? Or am I bad enough? Or I didn't give it up? Or what happened? No, that's the way it works, because here's how it starts. And it starts today with just a prayer. You're not going to be able to give it all up today, trust me on that one. <laughs> not for the big stuff. There's too much. There's too many pieces. There's too much healing that God has to do. And by the way, I believe that God wants to use other people in your life. Did you know that? That's what church is all about. I just don't see it happening any other way, to be honest with you. Maybe you can give me an example. I've just not ever seen it. Not for the big stuff. But if that's you, you know what I want you to do? Not, not totally do it all today. Here's what I want. Would you just open your heart to God today? See, now the problem is that many of us have opened our mind to God. And we can mentally say, remember what the guy said in the story? He's like, God wants you to open up your heart. And it makes so much sense because we go, yeah, I've mentally said, I forgive you. I can say that. I put that in the past. I, that doesn't bother me anymore. I forgot about that. But in here, right, would you open your heart? Would you open the feeling part? You know what I'm talking about? And I know as men, you know, compartmentalizing and, and opening that box is going to open up all kinds of emotions for you, right? And you've done so well keeping it all shoved down, but the truth is, is you don't do it because it resurrects at the worst possible moments of your life. Is that true? So all I'm asking today is this. Maybe just pray today, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. Hmm? <laughs> God, this is impossible. No one could ever forgive this. Yet, I beg to differ, there's a Savior hanging on a cross saying, with man it's impossible, but behold with God all things are possible. You can forgive. And when you do, even as you start, can I tell you what happens? Because this is what happened to me. Joy will enter like you've never felt in your life. <laughs> the only thing I can compare it to is the day that you have this huge guilt and you let that go to God, okay? If you're here today and you're the guilty one, maybe you need to let that go to God. So it works both ways. But let me tell you something. You know what's better than getting the guilt off of you? The day you learn to forgive. There is nothing. <laughs> you don't even realize how miserable you were until he fills your heart in a way that you cannot describe. <laughs> That's what I pray for you today. It starts with a prayer. Let's pray together. Can we stand? Father, I pray over each person here today. I pray for each person that's listening. Some, some people listening online, they go, I can't even enter the doors of a church because bad things happen to me in church. God forbid, but it's happened. If we were real honest, because we're liars. Because the church has become a bunch of liars. We cover up abuse. We cover up sexual abuse. We don't want to be honest with the way things really are. But today we want to be honest. I pray for the one God that's guilty, that today you help them understand they can receive forgiveness in Christ. That's all of us. I pray for the one God that's withholding forgiveness. Oh, that's all of us. I pray today, God, that we can forgive. And that we won't go back. That, Lord, we'll allow you to fill us that we'll, we'll look at the cross for the first time and realize, you know how I can forgive? Because Jesus did that. <laughs> and because there's a Savior that poured out His blood and the wrath of God poured out on Him so that I can forgive. <laughs> and I can finally not have to be miserable. I can finally not have to be in a prison. I can have the joy of God in my life. And I understand there's steps and I understand there's process, but I believe God with all my heart that whoever that is, and I think it's a bunch of us. If you could open up our hearts today, just a little bit. And as you come in, we, we, we want to give it all to you because there's nothing like having you there. God, please don't let us walk out the door and put on our mask. Please, God, don't let us walk out and, and just go, let's just go on with our day. Let's just go on with our life. Oh, nice message, Pastor. Oh, that really touched me. And then go on and keep on living. God, I pray, please, please. Don't let us do that. 
If there's anybody that hates God, I pray today that let them be filled with your power. I pray no more enabling. I pray no more abuse, no more making excuses for abuse, not going back into abusive relationships. I pray over that. But I pray for this, God, that the one that's, that they're hearing voices from beyond the grave that's defining them their entire life, they've been coming here since day one, yet that thing has not been resolved. And today, God, I pray they'll understand the power of the resurrection of Christ. That he dies on the cross and now he offers the power of the resurrection to us. I pray for that over each one of us today. Let us call out in our own way. And as we start this process, that we will be the church that we need to be to help each other get there. (laughs) Thank you, God. I thank you that Jesus prayed that way. I thank you that you love us, Lord. And I pray now that you receive all the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, if you need any prayer today, and I know this is sensitive today, if you need prayer, come pray with us. For everybody else, God bless you.